Do you like to keep your spindles turning and earning? Me too. Today with my buddy Ray Harkins at Lexington Technologies down in North Carolina. He's also an online educator with the Manufacturing Academy. We dive in and we talk to skills we want to look for in manufacturing, transferable skills outside the industry, that impending silver tsunami. He's got a few things that might surprise you about that. Without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome, Ray. I'm so glad that you could be here today. I know we have talked a lot about, you know, just the skills gap and the silver tsunami that's coming. So I'm glad you could be here today with me. Oh, I'm great to be here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Now, I know we first connected because you do a lot of course development, but let's start by looking at the pain right now that a lot of manufacturers out there are facing that you yourself in your day-to-day -day are facing. What's what's your exact title right now since you moved? Yeah, I do live in North Carolina now, and I'm the general manager of a machining facility where we okay. are, uh, make both tool and die for uh, larger equipment and do high volume production machining as well. Ray, as a general manager, you're very familiar with our subject today, uh, the, the pain of the silver tsunami, the skills gap. It, a lot of people talk about it. You're a man that's actually out there spending his evenings and weekends doing something to, mm -hmm. to make a difference here. Let's talk about some of the problems that we see, right? We've got the people retiring. We've mm -hmm. got everyone complaining about the lack of skills that are out there. Sure. So some of the problems is... As a manufacturer, you might outsource your work. You might send it out of house because you don't have the people in house to run it. Sure. Now you might end up giving up on contracts or doing a no bid situation, or maybe you can't fulfill that order from an OEM. So you're losing that work either to other companies in the country or to overseas manufacturers because they can mm -hmm. supply the volume necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Y you know, all of those and and more are, are problems in uh, leading a manufacturing organization. So uh, you mentioned the silver tsunami. I, yeah. I usually picture that as a, a supply side problem. If you if you look at labor as a commodity, where is our supply of labor coming from? So uh, on the supply side, yes, we have a large body of people that have retired and are continuing to retire. So this term silver tsunami, you know, refers to gray hair and uh, it ties back to the baby boom generation here in the United States, which was uh, people born post-World War II, generally 1946 to 1964, that 20 year span. So here recording this in 2024, People that are the youngest baby boomers are now 60 years old, whereas the oldest baby boomers are 78. So just some arithmetic would tell you that we are in the latter half of this silver tsunami. Uh, the people, uh, the, the majority of this age group have already retired and they are not being replaced at the same rate. Uh, I, I think, and I'm not a demographics expert, but no. undoubtedly there's less people being born. You know, the baby boom generation was a was a major uptick in birth rate. We don't have that birth rate today. But more importantly is that manufacturing as a whole now is competing with a lot of other employment opportunities. Even post-pandemic, so many remote uh, work opportunities, so many other ways to earn money, the whole gig economy and all of these things that have opened up here lately that are especially attractive to younger people, those young people aren't now going into manufacturing. And, and you know, manufacturing itself in a lot of scenarios, it's it's noisy, it's loud, you know, it's dirty, it's this, it's that. You know, so it's really not very popular, I would say, amongst other professions that younger people may choose. Yeah. And I mean, I, I love that actually your point about the like the later half of the silver tsunami is what originally sparked this. I think the idea for this recording and it's mm -hmm. something I hadn't thought about until you brought it up. But when you're talking about attracting the youth and making it attractive and the gig economy and th those are all definitely things out there. I mean, Again, yeah, like you said, the the baby boom was all those extra people. We just don't have that birth rate. There are countries in the world that still have that abundance uh, of people that are able to take the jobs. I think that's one of the reasons that we outsource mm -hmm. to overseas is just because when you need 100,000 units to supply the demand in America to, to meet your market needs, 
and you go to a local manufacturer, sometimes they don't have the labor, they don't have the, the, the bodies there because we don't have as many people. Sure. Some of them for sure are going to gig economy, but there are other careers out there that people are undertaking where it's not really gig work. It's not really like if you look at the fast food industry, mm -hmm. um, again, you, you can't do that remotely, but that right. the fast food industry, as an example, employs millions and they're out there producing food. They could also be in the manufacturing space. I mean, because in the end, it, it's all really manufacturing, whether you're in a restaurant business or a hot, or in some other soft skill service industry. It's it's all can be looked at through the lens of manufacturing. I actually have my wife to thank for that. Uh, she spent 15 years as a as a restaurant manager, and now she's in her third year running a trailer manufacturing company. Mm. And she has shared a lot of insights on that. That that would be a separate thing, but she just shared a lot of the the common skills mm -hmm. that can be available <laughs> in that line of training that she's using to run a trailer manufacturer with 100 people in it. Right? Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, that is that is interesting. Yeah, there Welcome are, I'm and, and maybe so this glad is that you could be here today. Maybe this we have is talked manufacturing about, professionals' you know, uh, shortcoming here in explaining coming, so what I'm skills are needed to become, you know, manufacturing professionals. Uh, there's always been a little bit of a gap between a kind of a classic gap between manufacturers and we'll say academia is you know a lot of young people, young adults go to college and learn skills and those aren't readily transferable to the workplace. That That is an old discussion. Uh, and I think part of it, the burden is on people like us, Arthur, to yeah. explain, you know, what skills are general managers and, and, and manufacturing organizations, what are they looking for? Mm -hmm. And some of those in your, in your wife's scenario can be transferred in communication and uh, team building, collaboration, a lot of the soft skills, those are very valuable in manufacturing. Yeah. But then there's this other group of skills too that uh, are d generally uh, developed through on the job training or perhaps um, s different uh, seminars that maybe suppliers put on or other opportunities there. So it, it's not a great flow of skills into the manufacturing world. I think there's opportunities for improvement there. Yeah, I definitely think more visibility on the skills that are necessary. I was in a conversation the other day where they were like, look, we really need to update like job descriptions. We, we do a terrible job in manufacturing. I know when I started in manufacturing and I got hired to run CNC machines, they were like, okay, well, go do this. And I'm like, okay, well, so I'm an operator now. What, what does that mean? And mm -hmm. there was, a lot of it was, was more of that archaic, just that communication verbally okay here put your hands here here do this use this mic like this here load the machine but it was all very like hands-on there was no communication up front of this is what you're doing mm -hmm. and i think that's something as a whole in manufacturing regardless of the role um also i think there's a lack of awareness when we talk manufacturing a lot of people think about the factory workers that are on the shop floors and they are the backbone. Without them, we don't really make anything. But manufacturing as an industry has so many career paths. I mean, sure. you mentioned purchasing, there's accounting, there's engineers, there's programmers, there are planners and shippers and receivers, and there's management levels and C-suite levels. And there's all kinds of different roles that are possible that would still get you working in manufacturing. I mean, I started assembling components, then I started machining components. Then I went into programming and setup and fixture design and more the engineer, manufa uh, manufacturing engineering side of things and leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I went into distribution. I'm selling to machine shops and, and sure. now I'm with MTD CNC and I travel the world recording conversations. All mm -hmm. of that is still in the realm. And I mean, you've got your own journey mm -hmm. uh, in manufacturing as well, right? Like there's yeah. so much yeah. available. Yeah. And, you know, the way you're explaining it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So you didn't do all of those things at one time. You no. started at a certain point, built your skills, opportunities open, et cetera, yeah. uh, to, to learn new skills. And then you kept building from there. What manufacturing offers very well is a career path. It's more than just a job. You know, I, I interview a lot, of, especially in the last few weeks, I've been interviewing a lot of people. And sometimes when I'm talking to a young person, very young, maybe perhaps right out of high school, 
I have to explain the difference between, you know, we're, we're offering you a job, but, but you have the opportunity for a career. Mm -hmm. If you don't want a career, if you just want this job and stay there forever, sure, that may be possible. Yeah. But there are so many other skills you can add. Uh, you mentioned a lot of them, uh, the technical skills, robotics and and CNC programming, and there's a whole world inside quality where a lot where I came from, like CMM programming and, and whatnot. So these would be like your hard data skills, but you're you're correct. Uh, accounting, managerial, HR, there's so many other things that you can learn, negotiation, sales tactics, et cetera. Yeah. You can learn these and build. And how great is it to have a, a salesperson, for instance, who has run the equipment? Now you're talking the language. They, you're, you're just exuding this vibe that says, I know what this machine does. The same goes for, for any other number of areas. If you've done the work, you're just going to be so much better at selling the product or managing a team or, or giving a sales pitch or standing in a, in a booth at a trade show. You know, you're, you're connecting with the people that are most important to you. So yes, lot, there's a career pathway on which a, you can build that with a lot of skills there. I think there's companies out there that really get this right, right? Like, like I mentioned, I travel with, with MTD CNC and I don't want to get too much into that, but the companies I get to interview are these super high performing companies that have found these people and made it very, very abundantly clear to them, look, this is a career. Mm -hmm. wherever you want to go, like just keep training yourself up and we will provide the different pathways that you can travel. Mm -hmm. And then these companies have gone from, in most cases, starting in someone's garage to now they're, you know, 700,000 square feet, a million square feet, 500,000 square feet, just massive facilities mm -hmm. because they really like clued into what you said there, right? Where they're like, <laughs> it is a pathway and mm -hmm. they just nurtured those people and they made it was very clear. If you want to stay still, that's cool. And if you want to grow, if you want to keep challenging yourself, if you want to keep pushing yourself, mm -hmm. we will provide you the skills. We will provide you the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I, for me personally, that's something I took on in manufacturing because <clears throat> I love that, that continuous learning mindset. And that's what I, why I recommend manufacturing. Anyone that doesn't like their job, I'm like, have you considered manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's such a rewarding career. Sure. You know, you mentioned the manufacturing skills gap earlier, and yeah. that is a it's it's alive and well. Unfortunately, the, it's it's hard to find the right set of skills in a in a person that you're going to bring on your team, for instance. Yeah. And then the other challenge, of course, is that that these skills are evolving as new equipment and new ideas and strategies come out. You have to evolve too. So, in a large company with uh, with a bigger infrastructure that can support this training effort, this learning and development effort, there will be a lot of opportunities to take the training, take the seminars and, and whatnot in-house. Mm -hmm. But for smaller companies, it, it would be a mistake to think that an employee is stuck because their company doesn't offer the right training they need. So it smaller companies tend to devolve to, we'll say, on-the-job training, and they miss a lot of those formal opportunities. Yeah. But there is a lot of middle territory here where an ambitious uh, in, uh, engineering or manufacturing professional can gain the skills they need to advance their own career independently of the company they happen to work for. So what I'm getting at is you publish on YouTube. That's the obvious example of, my gosh, we live in the information age here. You can learn anything, anytime for almost no cost. Uh, the problem is then the quality of the learning yeah. and this sort of thing. And, you know, so to you can go up a level in sophistication to so-called learning platforms. And that's where I've done a lot of my work on the side. So learning platforms are essentially websites where uh, students and instructors come together and the instructors share their courses and students take the courses but there's a lot of other there's a lot of other pieces in there there's quality control on the development side and then there's student reviews and and things like this you know but for a low cost on learning platforms you can gain 
tremendous high quality information, low cost, it meet a lot of needs, often that come with uh, credentials from, you know, large institutions and things like that. So there is no shortage of uh, skills that are being offered out there. It's now incumbent on the manufacturing professionals to go get those skills. And, and they've never been cheaper or more available ever. No, and that's a great point. And I, I know you've got a tip for how to find good deals on different learning platforms, like the like the Udemy that you instruct on. So I want to cir circle back to that later sure. in the conversation, because you're right. It One, it's low cost. It's vetted. It's It's got reviews. It's all of these good things. And there's the free stuff in YouTube. Yes. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Which again, not vetted. So it's, it's a little more dangerous. Um, but then there's also a middle ground in there for manufacturing professionals to take advantage of. And there's some free online resources that they could consume first, maybe to even see if they like the thought of manufacturing, because it gives you a little bit of the behind the scenes. Uh, there's companies like Sambit Coromont, who have their online metal cutting specifically sure. to machining, right? It's not going to go into the quality and the soft and all the other skills, but specifically for cutting, Sambit Cormont has an entire online learning platform that they keep redeveloping allied cutting tools. Uh, I always mess up their name. It's like allied machine and engineering or something. Mm. They, they've got a million square feet in the US. I love their tools. They've also got an online platform that's free. The only caveat with those platforms is sometimes they're centric to their own tooling offers. So you'll sure. learn around how to use their tools better. And you can still take that as general knowledge to mm -hmm. apply better to your own skills as a way. Now, again, these ones are specifically metal cutting, right? We're talking sure. about how vast manufacturing is, how many skills are outside of, of just the, the cutting, the machine operation side of things. I would like you to come back to talk about the tips you've shared before with me when it comes to mm -hmm. looking for courses on Udemy um, mm. and ways to maybe get them at a cheaper rate than you see by default mm. on the website. Mm -hmm. When I had told you, I was like, oh man, I'm looking at the prices and they're reasonable, but they're right. higher than I thought. So can sure. you share a little bit about that, Ray? Oh yeah, yeah. And and you're making a great point, by the way, uh, regarding Sandvik, which I just became familiar in the last maybe six months with their educational offerings. But many, many, certainly outside of machining as well, large suppliers of anything, equipment, uh, pneumatic components, electronics, there's so many areas. It really is an investment in their customer. It's not just free information. Even, even the information that's just technical in nature, not product specific, is really an investment in their customer base. By educating your customer, showing just the, just the, the properties of physics involved or the or just the the strategies involved with whatever type of component or or tool cutting or whatever it just it goes a long way to educate your people your potential customers and then of course you're right there is a slant toward their own products but anyway i think those go hand in hand in the end it's in the, in most of the supplier training that i've been a part of yes there's a bit of a sales pitch in there but on the whole, it's a great resource for uh, engineering and manufacturing training like we're talking about. In terms of the learning platforms, there are a number of platforms out there. Generally speaking, they're geared toward the cost conscious customer. They're geared toward people who are n not going to traditional university for this class. You know, So university level training, we'll call that the most expensive or close to it. This these learning platforms that actually involve universities. So aside from Udemy, I'll mention that in a second, but edX and Coursera are two popular originating here in the United States. A lot of the classes you can take for free and get the information. Now, credentialing, the quizzes, the peer review stuff, yeah, that's at an extra cost, but those are nominal costs as well, usually maybe a couple hundred dollars or even less. And you get an institutional issued credential, MIT, Harvard, all the big universities, or not all, but many of the big universities are offering those types of credentials, professional certificates and whatnot. Udemy is a, a different brand of different type of learning platform. So those, the instructors on Udemy tend to be professionals 
or they're they've they've honed their own craft and now they're teaching some skill and on Udemy, uh, which is, I believe, the largest learning platform in the world, manufacturing itself is a bit of a niche. Uh, they tend to gravitate toward the, we'll call it generally the computer sciences or design or things like this, but there's a lot of manufacturing content on there, low cost, and your point about the list price, the retail price versus the uh, probably average price a student pays, there's a big gap there. So. Udemy has lots of promotions and coupons and sales and going on all the time, you know. So it, in most cases, you won't be paying full retail price for those courses. The average purchase price for a course, the ones that I publish, is between $10 and $20. That's what the student is going to experience when they purchase that class. So is there, is there like a, a mailing list or some way for them to sign up for the coupons, do you know? Well, if you enroll in a class mm -hmm. on Udemy, then you automatically get enrolled into that instructor's on-platform mailing list. So I'm not talking okay. email, I'm talking about on-platform list. So yeah. that that message gets forwarded to your email, but there's a gap, there's a separation between the instructors and the students. So as a student of Udemy, for instance, they send you promotional materials that they believe will be interesting to you. Some of those materials are coming from the instructor through the platform. So in my case, where I publish um, a lot of manufacturing related content, I'll usually publish two promotional letters a month. And those letters, those announcements they're called come with coupon links. And a student is automatically opted into that. They could always opt out later, of course. But if you take a class of mine, for instance, and don't opt out of the promotional materials, then you'll hear from me twice a month automatically. I publish coupons uh, for all the classes that I offer on Udemy. And it, it is. It's a great way to save money and kind of stay in touch all at the same time. Yeah, and it doesn't sound like you're spamming them on a daily where they got to keep going through yeah. all of this every couple of weeks. And I mean, some of these courses could be shorter where they could accomplish them. And if we're talking to a young person that's committed to their journey in manufacturing and their journey in upskilling themselves, then it would make sense for them to leave those promotions on, take advantage of those promotions and keep furthering their own education. Sure. Um, and something here about that is, is I find that it's really important to fall in love with the learning process, mm -hmm. the joy that there can be by learning to overcome things, learning that you are capable of bigger things and then mm -hmm. continuing to just snowball that. Mm -hmm. And that's something for me that continued, I was able to continue to build in a career in manufacturing. A lot of the time, thanks to really good um, managers that I had over the years that had faith in me and were convinced that I could do it and took that stand to know so that, that I could advance my careers and I could do things. You know, like when I was going to program CNC's for the first time and I smashed the spot drill through a casting. Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> without without the right leadership in that position, right? I don't know how quick I would have been to get back on that horse. That was terrifying. Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, and you're right. I I certainly enjoy what I do as well in manufacturing, and that helps for sure. Uh, I think we both and 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 we we both know a lot of people who are intellectually curious they they want to learn they're they they want to solve problems and learn how things work and that alone drives a lot of uh, some of this continuous ed education and learning that we're talking about but there is another side to this as well and that is you even mentioned young person but the mistake a lot of professionals make i think is they tend to front load their training we'll say they go to university go to trade school whatnot yeah. And then, of course, they participate in any ongoing training that their company offers. Usually it's mandated or recommended, that yeah. type of thing. But how much the typical professional invests in their career on their own is surprisingly little. And this is maybe just my experience, maybe just here in the United States or that my corner or in manufacturing or my corner of the world. But 
everything is changing. I think we see this over and over again, just in my career, how computers and networks, computer networks and robotics and all this stuff has changed. Well, it's wise for a professional to take a portion of their money, a portion of their time on their own, outside of their workplace mandated training and reinvest it into your career. You know, I, you know, I own a home and um, every year I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do this year? How are my gutters? How's the basement? How's, do we need new siding? Or, you know, I'm always thinking about what needs patched up, what needs upgraded, etc. The same idea applies to your career. If you want your home to last, you're going to maintain it. If you want your career to last, you're going to maintain it. And that requires your investment of your time and your money. Find the resources. They're readily available. It's not that difficult, but you got to find the resources, find the, the niche that you want to focus on and plan accordingly. Invest, spend some time on a Saturday morning or uh, one or two evenings a week to build a new skill relevant to your career, your industry, and continue that process Developing a learning plan, for instance, maybe I didn't say I work on my house all the time, but maybe two or three times a year, I do have these thoughts, you know, so same, the metaphor applies to a career. If you want, if you're serious about your career and you want it to last until you're ready to retire, you're going to have to develop it. So uh, learning is one very valuable way to do that. It's not the only way, you know, networking and there, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but I can assure you building, sharpening your skill set is a, is a obvious and relatively inexpensive way to do that. Yeah. And, and it's not an America only thing. It might be like a North America, Western world is the title they use sometimes condition. Mm -hmm. Um, because I know other cultures do a better job of instilling that love of learning younger than we do mm -hmm. here in the Western world. But in the Western world, they've done studies and it's about 10% of the population that will do their own self-directed continued learning mm -hmm. without the enforcement of their company making it mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different learners that have looked at this. Uh, there's an entire coaching thing on the company side that talks about the benefits of making mandatory training a weekly event at your company, because otherwise your people are not going to upskill themselves. Sure. Um, so, so it's not just a you phenomenon or just a, not a you neck of the woods kind of thing, Ray. I, I've seen the same thing. And actually, until I read those studies, I had a lot of frustration. I was like, how come you don't get it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But all of that aside, that's for anyone that that's watching, that's the beauty about manufacturing, because if you don't find yourself wanting to learn more about the thing you're doing in that area of manufacturing, right. there's probably a vertical within manufacturing sure. that you could fall in love with learning more about to something to stoke that fire, to stoke your love of learning so that you can pursue your own area of excellence mm -hmm. and, and become truly great at that. You don't have to be great at something that you absolutely <clears throat> loathe. You can mm -hmm. shift and find and talk to someone a mentor, a manager, someone else that's just your senior and they've been in manufacturing longer and they seem to love what they're doing. Talk to other people. Sure. There's something definitely in there. It, I couldn't say it better, Ray. It's, it's definitely important to continue to advance. The analogy with the house is great, but the same thing applies to our own bodies. You know, mm -hmm. We're both getting older. I, you're talking silver tsunami and the side of my I, head is silver. Yeah, I, like... <laughs> I got a little bit too. <laughs> right? Yeah. But it's we know if we don't take care of our bodies, the same thing happens, right? It's mm -hmm. there's life doesn't offer any time where the stagnation is possible. The mm -hmm. moment you stop working on your home or your body or your health or your career, mm -hmm. you don't stay still, you start to decline immediately. Definitely. And it's only becoming a more rapid decline as we advance. You've already talked about the speed at which everything is continuing to evolve. Sure. Like, robotics and automation and we need robotics and automation for the record anyone that's got that trope that oh it's stealing jobs no we literally don't have enough Not, human bodies if you put every single human that's unemployed right now into manufacturing we yeah. would still be short hundreds of thousands of workers no there's doubt. no way to to do this without automation yeah okay yeah <laughs> but i agree yeah it's oh i can't remember the point i was going to make because after i said that my brain's just like, yeah I, 
<laughs> I, I'm catching the drift though. So when so your opening thought on the breadth of manufacturing skills. Yeah. There's there's a model that gets kicked around a lot. When you're looking at your portfolio of skills, you might say, it's often T shaped. In other words, you have a breadth of skills, that's the top line of the T, and then you have a depth of skills. That's that's your um the 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 depth of knowledge you have in one particular area. So in you for you Arthur, it's going to be machining. Like I, that's yeah. my impression. You know the most about machining, but then you know these other skills also, marketing and and video editing and production and other things. Of course, that becomes the top bar of your T. And and as manufacturing professionals, you're right. Maybe you get tired of. I got it. You know, you may be tired of operating a piece of equipment or tired of working as a quality manager. I know that for sure. I got tired of that. I had great depth. I could continue, but was I feeling fulfilled and was I up for a new challenge? Yeah, definitely. I was ready for something different. So that's where the breadth comes in. So when you're selecting targets for your learning journey, they don't necessarily just have to be deeper and deeper into your same silo. Yes, you can go out of your lane, you can expand. And to your point is manufacturing offers an enormously wide breadth. I like talking to younger professionals and, and successful professionals who often come to this kind of crossroads in their career where they can continue being an individual contributor. They can continue being a CAD designer or a CNC program. And they're, they've been successful and they could be continue to be successful adding those those vertical skills, you might say, the T. Yeah. Or this crossroads is then they go into management where then they're responsible for a team. Yeah. And one of the classic problems for successful individual contributors who decide to go into management is that they soon learn that the skills that allowed them to become a successful individual contributor are not all the same skills as those needed to become a successful team leader or manager or, or whatnot. So if you are at that stage in your career where you're thinking maybe it's time, maybe your boss has approached you or one of the executives of, you know, would you like to join a training program or something like this, that is a great opportunity then to consider what are those skills, data analysis and presentation and writing and accounting. And there's so many other skills then that become important that are different than those vertical skills you develop to become an indiv a successful individual contributor. Yeah, and I think, again, it ties into the person's desire to learn. Sure. Right? It, it's a different way to learn, but they've got to have that motivation. I, I know I've run into managers and I've run into some really great ones. And then I've also run into ones that were really good machinists. They got sure. into a foreman role and they developed zero people skills. Right. <laughs> sure. A very stark contrast between those two types of individuals. So again, it's that importance to to push yourself, to continue to develop, to pick something once or twice a week, a book, a course, something to challenge your mind. I love audiobooks while driving. I, I've done over 200 books this way because wow. I just keep putting one on. I, instead of the radio, I, I still do radio for music. Sometimes I'm not an animal, sunny day, my windows are down, my music is up. Mm -hmm. But otherwise it's books because sure. it's not about mastering it although i've chosen a few over the years to master it's about exposing myself to all these different ideas to keep right. my brain thinking about okay what's possible what's mm -hmm. possible oh it's possible for that human then it's possible for me mm -hmm. if another human can do it i know that i am capable of it it's just a matter of if i want to put in that work yeah um <laughs> yeah that, that, it's a great point um i I prefer podcasts myself. So my drive to work is usually a podcast. And but you're right. There's a the beautiful uh, cross pollination of skills and ideas where there may be people talking about something in a completely different field that applies to your field. And I, I enjoy the same thing. I, I like listening to ideas and, and yeah. problem solving frameworks and everything from psychology to marketing and business. I like listening to a wide range of things outside of manufacturing, but for the same reason, keep my own mind sharp. But every now and then I'm hearing an idea that's like, yeah, I need, I need to know more about that. And that ends up, starting my path down some new area of learning. Yeah, it. I think there's a lot to be gained from that, whether it's podcasts or YouTube videos, 
Um, I listen to a lot in the, the IT space for the same reason, mm. because there's other verticals or other industries that we can pull ideas from to bring into manufacturing to contribute back to it. And this would apply for people that are listening that maybe aren't in manufacturing and sure. they're, maybe they're in food, but maybe they're listening to this because they know that maybe manufacturing has something to contribute to the food industry or to Absolutely. whatever industry that they're in. Right? Sure. Um, yes. So I, I, I love it. That constant pursuit of the next thing we should probably sum up. <laughs> <laughs> I know yeah. you and I have great conversations. We've had a, quite a few um, and I know we could keep going, but mm -hmm. so we were talking about the, the pain, the silver tsunami, you know, we highlighted all of that really well. We mm -hmm. talked about some of the problems that come with the outsourcing, losing the work to overseas. Um, the, the one we didn't really get into and I don't want to get into it, but it's just, the reality is, is the reason that people like Ray and myself are out here having these conversations is because if we keep losing the work, the GDP of the country starts to crash, and then you, you're not gonna like the other side of this, okay? that That's the reality. We talked about transferable skills, mm, and then mm -hmm. we talked about in-house training, we talked about leveraging your suppliers, seeing them as valued partners to contribute to your training programs. I have done that so many times in distribution. I wish I would have known about that when I was running a machine shop because I would have had the suppliers in more for training. Um, my boss at the time was convinced it was brainwashing. Mm. I've learned different now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we'll put links to your Udemy stuff. I would love right. for people to check that out, especially if they're interested in the quality in the other areas mm -hmm. um, that you have published in. But it's a it's a good platform to look at. So we'll 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 bring some some links after this that we can kind of put in there. Sure. Uh, and then we talked. Why do we care? Well, I think we've been very very clear about our passion for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I liked your point earlier about, you know, our desire to reach outside of manufacturing. But yeah, I, I hadn't even thought there could be some insurance agent watching us now trying to figure out, you know, what idea do they need? Yeah. Uh, fabulous. Uh, you're right. I'm passionate about manufacturing, but I'm more generally, you're going to spend all of this time, whether you're in insurance or marketing or work at a garage or whatever, you're going to spend a third of your life out there doing something. Do something you enjoy. Do something that you are passionate about. And if you, if you can find that thing, that, that drives your desire to learn more about it. Uh, so that's where the skills and, and the YouTube videos and the podcasts and the books and all that come in, you know, so don't be stagnant. That would be my message to anybody. Don't be stagnant. Pick yeah. a career where there is a growth trajectory. And, and if you're not happy with the one you're in, go find one that does make you happy, but then let that be a platform for doing the reading, the classes, the, the, whatever, get the skills you need to be successful why make a third of your life dreadful? Go do something interesting, learn about it, grow in your career. You, you know, your your older self will thank your younger self that you made that decision. So just go do it. Insurance agent or whoever's out there listening, do it. Yeah, right, exactly. And that, I love that message. It doesn't matter what path you're in. Um, and something that one of the other reasons I just thought about um, that I love manufacturing so much is my cost to entry for my training for this was zero dollars. Nothing, zero. Absolutely zero dollars. I got to come in, I got to start making a decent wage. I got to start pushing myself, developing my skills with all of this on the job training. And then eventually when I got high enough, the company I was at paid for my training. Mm -hmm. They were like, look, get 70% or better, we'll pay for your training. Sure. And I, ha I have put, now I've put my own money in since then, mm -hmm. but, to start my career, to get to a rewarding level where I was in leadership, all of that was covered by working yeah. in manufacturing. Yeah. And how many other rewarding career paths do you have out there mm -hmm. where it's a, like a $0 startup cost? Right. No doubt about it. Yeah. So you, I think you mentioned ROI earlier. So yes, it's yeah. infinite when it costs you nothing to start <laughs> with. You know, yeah. the things that if you know, show up to work. I just hired, I hired a person on Thursday. His birthday was on Wednesday, his 18th birthday. He turned 18 on Wednesday. Yeah. I met with him on Thursday, gave him an offer. He accepted. He starts Monday morning. What does he have? A good attitude, 
you know, willing to work, willing to show up, you know, it doesn't take the things that you need to be successful are free. Uh, good attitude, focus, listen to what your trainers or your boss or others are telling you, pay attention, show up every day, smile, say good morning to people, you know, this uh, is free uh, to the to the to the person offering it. Uh, but it can go a long way. And and I and I love your example how, uh, you know, in time, maybe not right away, it might have taken a few years to get to that spot. Did, but yeah. in time, they want you, you know, let's send you to the seminar. Let's send you to the back to school. Let's send you to the trade school to gain, to formalize your skill set. And uh, that's pretty normal. That's pretty common in manufacturing, actually. Yeah. And, and I mean, talking, building on the skills, um, that you were talking about this young 18 year old, which that's awesome, right? I, I look forward mm -hmm. to them starting and, and finding a rewarding career there because sure. that's the next generation. And I want them to tell all of their friends about, Oh my God, I started manufacturing guys. This is awesome. Sure. Right. <laughs> right. But, but building on those skills, it, a couple more I'd throw in there is be coachable. Uh huh. Because if you're not, if you're not coachable, if you can't accept the feedback of your leadership, if you, if you're just kind of rough and like, ah, I know everything that's not going to work out for you in any career, not just manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you're being explained something and there's an inner need as a human being to be like, yep, yep. And agree with it. If you don't understand, don't nod. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> ask yes <laughs> they're not going to fire you they're going to appreciate your curiosity sure yeah i i agree and i think this uh intellectual curiosity i don't know how to teach that i don't know if that's genetic i don't know where that comes from i doubt some people are curious and some people not are not i i suppose there's some propensities in those directions but you can learn to become curious. It, it just takes a willingness and a want to, you know, I used to give this analogy a lot and I think we all do it. You're reading, or maybe you're listening to your audiobooks. It might be harder to do while you're driving, but you're reading and you come across a word, you don't know what it means. And you, the, the default tendency is just to try to infer meaning out of it or skip over that sentence. And maybe it'll become obvious in the next sentence. Yeah. Intellectually curious people pause to your point, ask a question or look it up yeah. in a dictionary or just right click on it and go to Google search type thing. And, you know, take a moment to learn what you don't know. And, and those things will pop up all the time. And you can, your example of just nodding is just like readers do all the time. They just skip over yeah. and I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out or I'll miss it. Um, don't do that. Yeah. Ask yeah. a question of your trainer, your supervisor, or take a moment to try to figure out what that means. But uh, it's an easy way, actually, to develop this intellectual curiosity is just catch yourself in the moment when you don't understand something, pause, ask the question. Yeah, that that I had never thought about that, right? That's mm -hmm. that's brilliant. And for the record, for anyone that listens to audiobooks, maybe you're stumbling with this. What I have discovered is as I can pause the audiobook and then I can say the voice activation cue for my phone. Sure. Um, I'm not gonna say it now because it will go off while we're recording and I don't want right. that you say the trigger word depending on if you're Google or if you're Apple mm -hmm. and then you just say, what's the definition of whatever word. Sure. Um, and then it will read it to you. As long as you make sure you got your Bluetooth hooked up, all your safety don't, I mean, you can pull over. That's fine sure. too, but I could just yeah. do it while I'm driving. I just hit the voice button and I say, Hey, what's the definition of this word? And then if I get more curious, then I can go into it deeper after, but otherwise it gives me a nice definition that's rounded. So mm -hmm. for any audiobook listeners, that would also apply to your podcast array while you're driving. Definitely, you totally pause that podcast and be like sure. sublimation. Wait, let me see if I'm thinking of that right. I don't know. I'm sure you know what sublimation is. Yeah, but it I, was the first word that it's the first word that jumped to mind for me. That's a little hard fancy. word. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> it's one I've had to look up. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. It really does. Yeah, well, this has been an amazing conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, I am so grateful that we both found the time that that we connected in the first place, right? Sure. Honestly, um, <laughs> I know this is like the third or fourth conversation we've had. This is just the first one we're recording. Sure. Um, is there anything you want to share or any requests you have of people listening that you would like to drop before we end the recording today? 
Uh, no, it, it's been a great pleasure for me as well, Arthur. I appreciate the opportunity. I hope the listeners and viewers of the video really gain one point, one thing that can help them advance their career. And I think we've offered people a lot today. So uh, I know you're going to give a, a trailer at the end of this, but I'm readily available on LinkedIn, Udemy, all sorts of areas. So I'm easy to get a hold of. And I love connecting with learners. So I try to make myself available to all my Udemy students if there's ever a question or comment. Uh, genuinely, I count it as a, a privilege to be part of others' learner, learning journey. So if you want to reach out to me, I know you'll provide my contact information. I'd love to hear from you. So Arthur, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Thanks so much for Ray for coming in today. And I mean, did you know that we're over halfway through the retirement of the baby boomers already? Talk about issues with our labor supply. We talked free training. We talked low cost training. We talked transferable skills and ways to get into the industry. And we talked about a whole bunch else. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, keep your spindles turning and earning.